What? All right. A couple things here before we uh, get going. And I've got a couple of songs that I want us to sing. Um, I think it's good for us to start singing again on Wednesday night. A few, one specific announcement tonight. Um, Jerry Phillips came up to me just a few minutes ago and mentioned that um, Saturday he's going to be here working on filling cracks um, in the parking lot and anybody that can help. What time, Jerry? 5.30 in the morning. <clears throat> right, Robert? No. Yeah, right. 7.30. Anybody that can come out and help, I know uh, Jerry would uh, really appreciate that. Let's do this. I want to lead us in a couple songs, and then um, I've asked if he's here. Hopefully, he'll be back here in just a little bit. David Workman to lead us in a prayer. And if David doesn't show up, I'm going to call on Joey. Joey, would you be okay if lead us in a prayer if uh, David isn't in here? All right, let's do this. Let's turn, since we've been in Thessalonians... We know there was that point in which the Thessalonian church, some of them were being warned of acting in, remember, in an undisciplined way and not working with their hands, minding their own business. Um, Paul got on them to instruct them about it. I thought, we'll sing 743, we'll work till Jesus comes. That sound good? Work for the night. There we go. I don't know that one, Dolly. You would have to, you guys would have to start me in that one. But um, let's go ahead and sing the first, third, and fourth verse. <clears throat> Seven forty-three. Oh, land of rest for thee, I sigh. When will the moment come? When I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. To Jesus Christ I fled for rest. He bade me cease to roam and lean for succor on his breast till he conduct me home. Will work till Jesus comes. Will work till Jesus comes. Will work till Jesus comes and will be gathered home. I sought at once my Savior's side, no more my steps shall roam. With him I'll break death's chilling tide and reach my heavenly home. Will work till Jesus comes. Will work till Jesus comes. Will work till Jesus comes and will be gathered home. Turn back to 660. <clears throat> We've also been talking about quite a bit here the last several weeks about our Lord coming back and keeping that in the forefront of our minds and then keeping the, 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 the reality as much as we can of heaven and heavenly things and dreaming, dreaming about those heavenly things and that heavenly habitation in our minds. Let's sing There Is a Habitation. We'll sing, um, let's do all the whole song. There is a habitation built by the living God 
for all or every nation who seek that grand abode. O Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to see. O Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell? in thee a city with foundation firm as the eternal throne nor wars nor desolation shall ever move a stone O Zion Zion, I long thy gates to see. O Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? No night is there, no sorrow, no death and no decay, no yesterday, no morrow, but one eternal day. O oh, Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to see. O Zion, Zion, when shall I dwell in thee? Within its pearly portals, angelic armies sing with glorify immortals the praises of its king O Zion Zion I long thy gates to see O Zion Zion when shall I dwell in thee. David, will you lead us in a prayer? And then after the prayer of kids, you're, you'll be dismissed. Oh God. Our Father God in heaven, we're so thankful for this day. Father, we thank you for allowing us to pause on our way to come together and study a portion of your word. Ask that you continue to be with Kurt and his studies. Ask Give Cody a safe journey and a successful hunt. They will shine in the family if it's there without him. Father, we're mindful of those that have lost loved ones, those that are bereaved. We ask that you would comfort them as only you can. Father, we have people that are on our hearts that are struggling with their health, and we ask that you would continue to bless them, and if it be your will, return them to their normal walks of life. Father, we're so thankful for the youth that we have here. We ask that you would help us to encourage them, keep them rooted in the faith. Father, we're thankful for those that are on foreign soils and in our military that help protect our way of life. We ask that you would comfort them, keep them strong, and Father, if it be your will, bring them back home safe to us. Father, be with us always. Continue with us through this week. Help us to be here Sunday at the next appointed time. Be with us always. Father, we love you. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right, kids, you're dismissed. So I got a prayer request for you guys. I have a good friend of mine. He's a preacher. He's a great preacher, actually, and from Colorado. And his um, 
his son, oh, it was about a couple months ago that he was, he's young, he's in his early 20s, he was diagnosed with testicular cancer. And um, so uh, going through chemotherapy right now, and they're having some ups and downs. He's handling it really well. He's strong. He's healthy. Um, his name is Jacob. I ask that you pray for him. And the, the last name is the Pace family. So if you, you just will keep the, uh, them in your prayers, I, I know they would really appreciate it. Um, but there's some, a few complications. I don't know all the details. I know that they're concerned that um, the cancer may have spread a little. They're not sure, so they're going through some tests and some other things. But um, I know, it uh, goes without saying, um, they are under a lot of stress and uh, pressure. Um, so I just ask you to pray for him. Um, he preached a sermon about a year ago, and it was on God's peace and where where that peace comes from. And um, he he made the, the the statement. He quoted this. He said, "You will never be at peace in this life until you are at peace with the next life." I saw that quote this morning um, on Facebook. Uh, one of his friends had sent this to him to remind him about what he said a year ago in one of his sermons. Um, and I think that's really good. I think that's very true, what, what he said about peace. And that, I think it ties in with our study of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, right? Um, this is something about God's peace in the next life, right? But, but understanding we're not going to know or be at peace in this life until we are at peace with the next. And I think that's why we need to make sure that we're constantly talking about these things. We know we have a heavenly home, but how easy it is for us to, you know, not discuss it or carry on with other topics and not, not think on these things and chew on these things uh, often, that this is not... We sing it, right? We sing a lot of songs about it. This world, one of them, this world is not our home, right? Right? We are passing through. Um, we're, we're headed to the, the, uh, God's promised land, his eternal promise that he has granted to us in Jesus and promised to us in Jesus. So we need to re talk about this. We need to sing about it. We need to teach about it and remind each other about it. And um, that way we can as best we can, make sure we are at peace with that. Another thing you've heard me say, we don't want to set our roots too deep here. Don't, don't hold on to this place, church, too tightly. Uh, because this is not where we're, we're going to, to, to remain, where we're going to stay. All right, so we're studying uh, Second Thessalonians right now. And um, again, I think this goes with it. Jesus is coming again, the parousia, the second coming. He is coming again. Could be in our time, could be a long time away. We just don't know. But the key is readiness. The key is preparation, right? Being prepared for, for that day. You know, we opened up our minds for a, a while and we uh, discussed the topic of heaven. And um, what is it that's going to make heaven a happy place? Remember, I think last week we did a little bit and the week before. Um, and one of the, the, the main things that we discussed was this idea of rest and restfulness. And I know some of you are here tonight. You're probably pretty tired from the week. You get the importance of rest. How important it is um, to rest our bodies, to rest our minds. And so there is something to this eternal life that we have with God where there is a rest. This is a, a restfulness. Now, when we looked at the Thessalonian Christians and what they were going through, we talked about the affliction. There's rest from that, right? They're not going to have to worry about being afflicted anymore for their faith or those that went through severe persecution, right? We go through persecution, nothing like them. Paul said, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Will be persecuted. So if we desire to be 
godly in Christ and live out our faith, there, chances are we're going to have some persecution. It might be verbal. People might just reject us. But there is opposition, right, to being a Christian. I bet you all of you at some level have experienced that opposition. If you're living out your faith. We talked about rest from the pain, no more pain, no more sorrow, uh, persecution again. Injustice was won quickly. Unfairness in this life. Anybody want that dealt with all of the unfairness of our world? The injustice? Absolutely. And, and Paul will talk about that, um, that, li well, life isn't fair, but God is going to deal with those things, remember? God, there is going to be a reckoning of these things. God is going to right the wrongs. And specifically to Paul's letter, it had to do with those that were afflicting the Thessalonians. Right? He was proud of them for enduring through the affliction that they were going through. And so we have that instruction that, listen, God is going to deal with that. God is going... Uh, our God is a righteous God. He, God's righteous judgment is going to judge and make all of that right. Remember when I said paydays are coming? Now, I don't believe for us, not for God's people who are faithful, but for those who are against God and against the church, those who afflict God's people, there's a payday coming. And uh, pa Paul, re Paul reveals that. Um, did I mention Psalm 1 last week? I don't, I don't think I did. You remember in Psalm 1, real quick, and we're going to get to our, our we're going to get to the letter in just a moment, but I want to just kind of uh, rehearse some of this, rehash it, and then we'll, we'll dive into some things uh, tonight. Um, but David in Psalm 1, and I love Psalm 1, where David says, how blessed is the man who, so it's a contrast there between the blessed and the wicked, Right? which many Psalms deal with that wickedness uh, versus righteousness, those that are blessed, and then the opposite of that or curse. You see that throughout the Psalms. You see some of that even in the Proverbs. But um, he says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers, for his delight, or but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now notice David said, he'll be like a tree. There's our imagery, right? What is the blessed man like who meditates, ponders and thinks and dwells upon the word of God day and night? He's going to be like a tree that is firmly planted by streams of water. So you get that image, right? Stable grounded, secure. It's uh, leaf does not wither, right? He bears fruit in its season. His leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, the blessed man, he prospers. But then he contrasts that with the wicked, right? Where he says, the wicked are not so, but they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. But I want you to notice this idea of God's judgment. He says, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. And I think there's something there that God is going to deal with the wicked and they will not stand. They do not have a stand. I think part of that is they will not literally stand before God. They will not handle it, be able to handle it in the judgment because of their wicked ways. There is that idea of a payday coming upon the wicked. And even David will bring that out in Psalm 1. Now look at Paul's letter, 2 Thessalonians, remember halfway down, verse 7 of chapter 1, there's the idea of relief, remember? He's going to give relief to you who are what? Troubled, what does the other translation say? Afflicted. That's God's promise, Paul says. He's going to give relief to those who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution, two kinds of people, those who don't know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And notice 
Verse 9 and 10, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. So they're not going to be in the presence of the Lord. Um, They'll be separated from his glory, the glory of his power forever. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day, so there is that day that is coming, and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. Go back to 2 Corinthians for a moment, if you would, while we're on this topic. While we're on the topic of, we're thinking about Jesus coming back, what's going to happen, what Paul says is going to happen to the wicked, those in context against God's people, the Thessalonians afflicting them, but also thinking on the heavenly things because that's part of what our experience is going to be in that day. I want you to notice verse 16 through 18. I love this passage, and if you're one that likes to memorize, this is a good one. Chapter 4, 2 Corinthians. Remember early on in the Corinthian letter, he's going to mention sufferings to the Corinthians. Paul's desire, part of what this letter is about, to comfort them in their affliction. The God of all comfort. He'll talk about that in chapter 1. So there's similar background here. There's the struggle of the church. But verse 16, chapter 4, Therefore we do not lose heart. Paul said, But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. You can tie that in with uh, Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 2, right? We're not conformed to this world, but we are transformed by what? renewing over and over again, renewing of the mind. So Paul said, we, I don't want you to lose heart. Our outer man is decaying. We know that's true, don't we? We feel it. But notice, yet our inner man is being renewed daily or day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing in us an eternal, listen to this. Whatever that momentary light affliction they're going through, whatever affliction we have, I hesitate calling it light, but Paul can because Paul went through some serious affliction himself. Plenty of suffering, right? We know all the things, that the dangers of this and the dangers of that. Paul went through all sorts of, of problems beaten right from the jews he was left out in the in, in the ocean to die he's he was i mean he went through all kinds of stuff so paul can call it momentary light affliction all right but notice he said it is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison while we look not at the things which are seen But at the things which are not seen, the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What do you suppose, just for a minute, and I'll throw this out for discussion, what do you think Paul means when he calls it an eternal weight of glory? What's all all that talk of uh, an eternal weight of glory? Say that again. Well, it'd be better than anything here. Notice he says that there isn't a comparison, right? There is no comparison uh, with the afflictions Paul said that they were suffering and the glory, Paul calls it, that is going to be revealed. But I love that idea. Uh, There's something there, and I think it's just looking at it from a little different angle the, an eternal weight of glory. He's, yes, going to be better than anything. What other thoughts do you have on that? I want you to think about for just a moment 
I want you to think of the idea, because I think it carries with it an idea of pressure. The idea of pressure is there as a result of God's approval. My yoke is easy, but my burden is light. There may be something there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, there is a glory coming. Okay, good. Yes. Just the very presence of, mm -hmm. yeah, yes, I, I, I think you're, I think you're right on, um, I think there is a part of that, again, we don't, <laughs> we don't fully grasp it, if we did, we wouldn't need faith, right, and trust, um, but I, I think there's something there. Let me il illustrate this way and we'll move on from this. I just wanted to kind of get your mind stimulated on that for a minute. When I was a kid, baseball was, was big. Anybody here play baseball when you were kids or softball ladies? A lot of you played ball and I played ball. And when I grew up, my dad was my coach. I mean, he coached me in, from the time I started playing until I became a young teenager. And uh, dad was a really good coach. Um, and at the end of the season, I don't know what you guys did growing up and what they do today, but we always had a day where we, all the families and the whole team would meet for pizza, Pizza Hut or Shakey's. Anybody remember a Shakey's? Hey, <laughs> all right, Shakey's, but uh, I haven't seen Shakey as Shakey's in a long time. Yeah, <laughs> but I, we would, we would meet up for pizza and, um, of course, us kids would be out playing video games, and it was time to come together, and, and uh, Dad would get up, and he would introduce. He always had trophies for the kids. Every kid got a trophy at the end of the season, and one neat thing that Dad did along with the trophies was he would buy a box of brand new Little League baseballs, never opened, still in the white paper or wrapper, and he would write on, on for every kid their name and then their stats. So you had your on-base average, you had your batting average, stolen bases, you know, uh, Jason, you know, stole 10 bases, uh, and he would put the stats that he had for every kid, which was really kind of cool. So he would not only give us that uh, uh, trophy, but he would give us a baseball, and he would, he would call each kid up. So he would, you know, say, Jason, come on up here, and he would say something about every kid, something really good about the kid. You say, you know, Jason, he was our second baseman, and Jason was a great player. Um, one thing that was unique about Jason is he could play every position. We could call on Jason, and he was there, and he'd do a great job. And then, last but not least, right, it would come to his own son. Now, you need to understand, Dad didn't say a whole lot about and I don't want to paint this bad picture of my dad because it wasn't that he was mean or that he never said anything but it was very few and far in between. And I'm telling you, I'm at 50, and I think some of you could will, will relate to this. When Dad called me up in front of everybody, and he would say, now, um, what, what can I say about this guy, you know, or something like that? He'd put his arm around me, and he would say, this is my son. And he would affirm me before everybody there. He would approve of me as my father. And I cannot put it in words to this day. I cannot describe to you the feelings of that weight, that pressure which was wonderful that my father has approved and affirmed his son. Let me tell you, I really think, although this isn't everything about the weight of glory, I think there's something in that. 
Because remember, we're going to hear what? Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest, right? You did a good job. There's an affirming of our father. Now listen, we know he approves of us here right now, but we don't know it by experience and his presence. We're going to. And I can't wait for that day because I can still, now I have a hard time even telling you that story. I'm surprised I didn't start crying like a baby because those things make me a little bit emotional when I think about being affirmed by, by my father because it didn't happen a lot, but when it did, it was a wonderful thing. And our God is going to affirm us as well. All right, so all of that, boy, we haven't even gotten in. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians. Um, I'm not going to rush through this. We're in uh, chapter 2. And we are going to look at, and we're probably going to be here for a while. Can't guarantee how long, but we're going to be here for a while. Because we have the explanation of the day of the Lord, and I do believe that that is the day, that coming, final coming, when Jesus uh, comes back. I know there's a lot of discussion on this, as I've already shared with you. But remember, there was this, I don't want to call it a problem, but a teaching, let's say, of the time where some of the Thessalonians believe that this has happened. Right? Paul needs to clear up some of this stuff. So we're going to look at the day of the Lord, and then we're going to look at in this chapter that it couldn't be that because there are some things that have to come before that day. There's some things that Paul said are going to take place before that day, so we know that it hasn't come. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and read chapter 2 and um, just kind of get it in our thoughts, and then we'll uh, work through it a little bit. Paul said, we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or letter as if it was from us, right, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. It hasn't come, Paul says. Let no, uh, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. So that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And that's a key to this, I think. Whoever this is, or whoever they were, and we'll, we'll work on that in a little bit, they display, will display themselves as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? So Paul had already been instructing them on these things. And you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearing of his coming. So that one or they will be uh, uh, destroyed uh, at that point. He will slay with his breath of his mouth, bring to an end by his appearing of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accordance with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false 
in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this that he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you were called by Jesus, to gain the glory of Jesus. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or mouth or by letter from us. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Now, obviously, we don't have time, <laughs> right? We're going to have time, though. I promise we're going to get into this stuff, all right? But first of all, we look at the explanation of that day, and then secondly, the events that were preceding that day. Now, I know you know that this is a very difficult passage, not easy. I'll be the first one to tell you. Um, and although I believe we have an idea what Paul is talking about, I think it's very hard to prove a one-man theory about who this was. But we are going to get into this, so I want you to do your reading, and we'll come back and we'll discuss. But let me back up real quick before we end tonight's lesson. Let's look at verse 1 and 2 for just a moment. I think it's important to note that Paul is showing some, something is happening to them as Paul is writing this. As of the writing, something is causing them to be very stirred inside. Very agitated. The expression actually, it means shaken up in mind. You ever heard somebody said you were scared out of your wits? That's the level of what Paul is talking about here. They're unsettled. It's, a, it's really, the, the, it, it's also used the same word of the loosening of the ropes of a ship from its moorings by, from the storm, from the rough seas. Same thing. Something is agitating and shaking them up to the point that they are shaking out of their wits. Okay, so this is a big deal of what they're going through here. They are losing their control and their ability to reason. And I think, and I'm going to close here. I'll just go back real quick to chapter 17. Remember when Paul comes to Thessalonica and begins the church. He comes to the synagogue of the Jews and he reasons with them about the Christ for how many, how many weeks? You remember how many Sabbaths? About a month, close to a month. That's all Paul had with him. And then there were those that followed Paul as a result. But remember what happened. There were some things that happened in Thessalonica that caused Paul to split. I think this is part of it. I think if you look at verse 5 of chapter 17, but the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace formed a mob and set the city in uproar, attacking the house of Jason. They were seeking to bring them out to the people. This was tough. They, were dra they dragged Jason, verse 6, and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men have upset the wor uh, who have upset the world have come here also. Look at verse 13, and then we'll stop here. And we'll carry on next week where, we, where we're going to leave off. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. So here is part of the problem that they are dealing with. Other things I think are part of this as well, but let's go ahead and we'll just close there. I, I, I know we didn't get very far in this, but we'll revisit it next week. Any comments? Questions? All right. Have a great week.